growth hormone is liberated. And I want you, again, you've got to think integratively. Write down a big hint somewhere in your notes. I want you to think about those problems with gigantism and all the different situations we talked about with growth in relation to this. I want you to try to integrate, right? So you can integrate pregnancy and how it relates to glucose metabolism. And, and on Tuesday, we're going to integrate how glucose metabolism affects blood pressure, optimal regulation. You know that, uh, what else we got? We know that thyroid hormone is a general catabolic. But it's catabolic because it wants you to build protein. We know that cortisol, sorry, that says cortisol is causing you to break down everything. I'm a fat guy, so I'm just saying. Cortisol, so cortisol, if you think about it, can give symptoms of diabetes as well. You can have high glucose and symptoms of diabetes that have nothing to do with any of the types of diabetes described here, but too much cortisol will cause you to have carbohydrate breakdown, glycogen breakdown, and high glucose. One that I didn't put up, up here yesterday, you can put it on your own if you want, is epinephrine. Because epinephrine is not involved in general maintenance, but epinephrine causes a breakdown of glycogen and leads to glucose. It's a fight or flight, you just got this perk right there. It's the fight or flight hormone. So when epinephrine spikes, you get a big temporary increase in glucose. I, I don't put it up there because, like, you know, other than that brief moment that these guys just had down here, or like when the rabbit popped out of the box. Epinephrine is not normally involved in balancing your glucose, but it, it can go on yours if you want. Epinephrine, which is the same thing as um, adrenaline. Yeah. Oh, man. And finally, we put androgens up here. Right? That was the last thing. Because androgens are involved in protein anabolism and muscle, but again, it's mostly because they block cortisol's catabolic effect on protein. So androgen is binding to or somehow blocking the glucocorticoid receptor. Now somebody asked me some questions about cortisol and fat redistribution. Who was that? What's your name again? Dan. Dan. I looked that up. And I told you, I've looked it up for years and never found the answer, but now I have the answer. So it turns out there's two other hormones also that affect fat distribution without affecting fat metabolism. But let's talk about cortisol first. So cortisol, you may have read these things about it causes you to get belly fat or abdominal fat. It also causes you to grow fat in the back of your neck for some reason. It's because of the following. Cortisol is catabolic. Who was asking me about septic capacity? Cortisol is catabolic. Stimulates lipolysis. So you do fat catabolism. You release free fatty acids. But the cortisol receptors in the abdominal fat and on the back of the neck are very low capacity. So cortisol is stimulating you to burn and release fat everywhere else, but then it accumulates in the back of your neck and your abdomen because there's very low cortisol receptor there, very low capacity. See? You can expect those types of questions to appear again. It turns out, and I learned this at the same time, so Dan, don't learn something else. I, I literally just learned this either last night or this morning. I think they're all running together. It turns out, you know, I told you androgen causes uh, more body fat in the trunk and visceral around the organs. Because it turns out that androgens do this not by affecting fat metabolism, but androgens. <coughs> <coughs> so androgen do something called LPL. I just learned this yesterday. I'm so happy when I learned this stuff. Lipoprotein lipase. Because the free fatty acids travel as a as a lipoprotein. And so androgens induce the lipoprotein lipase 
And that's what allows the fat now to come into the cell where it can be stored. So where do you think? This test question right here. This kind of question I asked. So if men have higher visceral fat, which is bad, that's associated with type 2 diabetes. If men have more visceral fat, fat around the organs and on the upper body, where do you think the highest antigen receptor capacity would be? Upper body or lower body? <coughs> So the difference is, the reason why men store fat, visceral, and upper body is because there's a difference in androgen receptor capacity. And the androgen induces this lipoprotein lipase, which causes those cells to take up fat. Why don't women store fat there? Would there be a difference in receptor number in the visceral fat and trunk of women? No, I didn't hear me say that. And it turns out that estrogen regulates the same LPL. But the estrogen receptor capacity is highest around the hips. So women, females, XX individuals tend to, people with ovaries, tend to gain fat around the hips rather than the trunk. And it's because of a difference in receptor capacity. And you can think about whether it would be higher or lower than where it would be. I thought that was pretty cool. I, I, I never knew why that was. All right. I think that's all I have to say about that. There's more coordination involved. There's more co coordination involved. But you, but you understand, though. Why all these hormones are involved in glucose metabolism, you understand why they're not in the glucose step, right? They don't respond to glucose. The growth hormone does not respond to glucose. It may affect glucose. The thyroid hormone does not respond to glucose. It may affect glucose, but it's not a part of the glucose step. In the same way that there might be hormones that affect the HPG, but they're not a part of the HPG. The only thing that responds to glucose, and glucagon doesn't even do it directly. If you think that's confusing, wait till Tuesday. We talk about osmoregulation and sodium, because nothing responds to sodium, but it's regulated. So understand why these, why prolactin is not on here, why there's only two hormones on there, even though there are others involved in intermediate metabolism. Your body doesn't play around. Your body does not want glucose levels to go up, even after you eat a meal. So the body gets ready. Their digestive hormones, or that's not what they're called, gut peptides. Gut peptides, I didn't make that word up. Their gut peptides <coughs> that actually respond to when you eat food and help regulate digestion and metabolism. I'm going to write it down and tell you what they do. I'll try to go slow. The first is secretin. And this stuff, the, this stuff, the coordination of digestion and metabolism is probably as about exciting as the coordination between the fetus and the mom. I just haven't quite figured out how to make it so exciting yet. But if you think about the things I'm going to tell you, it's pretty cool. So secretin, well, one or two things. When your stomach fills with food, the stretching of your stomach causes the release of secretin from the stomach. That's, you know, I'll write down what they do. It'll make me go slower. Did somebody say thank you? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. Secret is stimulant HCL and pepsin release. Pepsin comes from the stomach, right? It's pepsinogen and it becomes pepsin. Yeah. So when your stomach fills, you release this hormone and it causes HCL, because the stomach has like some crazy pH of like three or something, doesn't it? I think I should say it, I don't remember. It's low. It releases HCL and pepsin. But if you eat at a regular time, secretin comes out 
in, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? In anticipation of your meal. So if you regularly eat at noon, you know how if it's a little bit late, your stomach starts all like, and it starts secreting acid. Because secretin actually can get synced to a clock if you eat at a regular time. Otherwise, anytime you get a big meal, it comes out. Then, and oh, you know what? I'm sorry, that's tough. That's gastric. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> but just like you on the exam, if you catch it, cross it out first, you don't get points taken off. So <laughs> that's gastric. Secret is the next one. Secret comes from the small intestine. Secret causes the release of bicarbonate to neutralize the acid. And the neutralization in its inhibits the secret. And that comes from the small intestine. No, 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 so, so, so sorry. It's not outside of the body, it's actually on the, on the other side of the stomach. So they're not inside the stomach. So that's a good question. So these aren't, these aren't going into the digestive tract. They're being secreted from the, uh, what's that, the basal lamina side of the, of the digestive tract. So they're not in the digestive tract. They get digested as they work. So they're coming out and then stimulating in, in, I guess, a paracrine way. But you're gonna see in a minute, some of them have real endocrine action. Uh, cholecystokinin. <coughs> cholecystokinin responds to fat also comes from the small intestine. And it, okay, so here's one that's a true endocrine. It's secreted by the small intestine and it causes the gallbladder to contract and the gallbladder then releases the bile salts that help emulsify the fat. Then also from the small intestine, it's GIP, which stands for your insulin before you even digest the carbohydrate and the glucose comes in. And also, if you're on a cycle, if you eat every day at 12, you know how you get kind of hypoglycemic if you skip? That's because GIP thinks you're about to eat and is stimulating your insulin. And then if you skip a meal, that's why you feel like lightheaded. You know what I'm talking about? You guys get that? Like lightheaded. And then finally, one you've heard of before, To the, stomach, uh, to the stomach and intestine because you got to take the stuff you digested away. So that's pretty cool, right? How you're coordinating all that stuff. And most of those are stimulated by the stretching of your digestive tract. 
with the exception of CCK that's mostly stimulated by fat. So if you eat a high fat diet, CCK goes up. We're good? And again, none of these drugs have an intermediate metabolism, but they have a big impact on how well these hormones can work and how well the nutrients get to where they need to go. Oh wait, there's one more, right? Sorry, I'm not cheating, I'm just looking at that. <laughs> what? You guys can't look at your phone in the exam. So if there's, one, there's one more. How can I get, forget ghrelin? Ghrelin increases appetite. It increases uh, growth hormone, and it increases uh, so ghrelin is a hormone that comes from the, the digestive tract in general. I don't know if there's a, a specific place. It increases growth hormone, it increases appetite, and it increases this dopamine response, this sort of, a, what is it called, reward? Who takes the color? The dopamine induce, yeah, it like makes you feel good. So it's the same response that you get after orgasm, this dopamine thing. So if you eat a good meal and, and orgasm, the same pleasure centers in the brain are regulated, which is interesting, right? If you think about it, the only two things you have to do to survive as an individual, that you have to actively do, right? You don't have to actively beat your heart. The only two things you have to do to survive as an individual, eat, and have sex are both rewarded by this dopamine response in the brain. The same, interesting to think about. And then lastly, before we talk about getting overweight, I mean like hormones from fat. So there's some hormones that come from fat. One of them is leptin. The more fat you have, the more fat cells, the more leptin you have. And it's a satiety hormone. It says you're full. You don't need to eat more. And it was discovered, I think I was already teaching this class. So it wasn't discovered that long ago. And everybody thought this was going to be the cure to obesity. You just, because what they did is they took a mouse model and they knocked out the leptin and I should show you guys the pictures. And you get these incredibly fat mice. Right? So every so it was called the fat hormone. So everybody thought you're going to be the inject leptin and everybody would be skinny. It turns out though that most obese people have high leptin already. They don't respond, they don't have the leptin receptor. So injecting leptin doesn't do anything. But it's a tight oh, It works by jack stack, if you're interested. And it binds to the same cells in the brain as ghrelin. So it's like yin to ghrelin's yang. You're trying to get the cells to do opposite things. And usually there should be a down. Uh, there's one called. Increases insulin sensitivity. Usually obese people have low adiponectin. I don't know why they do. And finally there's one, at least the last one that I can remember. High resistance, yeah. So when you say insulin sensitivity, what are you talking about? Increasing insulin receptor or insulin receptor response. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, and the liver. That's specific to the liver. Specific to the liver. So,
And again, people who are obese typically have low leptin levels. I'm sorry, have high leptin levels, but don't respond, don't have the receptor. That means that, I guess in plain English, that means that they don't know when they're satiated or when they're full. They don't have the signal from the fat cells that decreases appetite. Well, they have the signal, but they're not responding to it. They have high leptin, but they're not responding. Well, these people typically have decreased adiponectin, which means they have decreased insulin sensitivity, which again is telling you that the type 2 diabetes associated with obesity is not just about insulin. Other hormones are involved. Obese people also tend to have high resistance. So again, it's going to contribute to the type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Uh, if it's whether it's genetic or whether it comes with some kind of condition, I don't know the answer to that. So all I know is that the trials where they tried to use leptin and when they measured leptin, they found out they already have high leptin, they just don't respond to it. But they have high leptin because they're obese and lots of fat. But the people who are, that were measured. But whether or not whether or not that's induced by some condition or whether or not that's a genetic condition. So what about somebody who gets like uh, gastric bypass surgery and has all that endocrine tissue removed from their body? I've never been asked that question before. Um. And I, I guess they, they would have impaired responses. Uh, some of the major ones being um, like the absence of GIP, depending on what they had removed. Uh, because I, I just read an article that says that... Uh, People that have that uh, gastric bypass surgery get really depressed afterwards, and, and the suicide rates are, are pretty high. So I wonder if it's linked with this dopamine response in the in the ghrelin. Oh, in the, that's, that's an interesting. I don't. Know. I never heard that, but that, that's an interesting question. Another condition, and actually, and, and this is where it brings it back home, is low thyroid hormone. Speaking of which, I just found out is associated with depression, but low thyroid hormone is also associated with obesity because if you have low thyroid hormone. Right? If you're knocking out thyroid hormones and all these conditions, and remember that thyroid hormone stimulates growth hormones. So if you have low thyroid hormones, then you also tend to have high obesity. In my own case, I was a wrestler in high school, and who, who's ever wrestled? I, and you did all that making weight stuff and like losing 20 pounds a week and all that crap and not eating. So it turns out that if you starve yourself and go on extreme diets, you can actually become clinically hypothyroid. And so you can look at that map and see what happens if you actually do become, if you do lose your thyroid hormone or become hypothyroid. So your basal metabolic rate goes way down. So I could sit next to one of you skinny guys, eat the same amount of food, you'll be fine. But just sitting next to each other, you're burning more calories than I am. So my, my recommendations are uh, not dieting, because one, if you think, but again, two out of three of you, according to statistics, will be in this situation. Because one, you have to, Develop a lifestyle that you're going to keep. Diet means you're going to do something for a little while and then do something else. Like in my mind, so I just started in May. I was 250. I need to be 140. I just, and actually, it's an interesting time to give this lecture. I'm halfway. I'm 195. So 55 pounds down, 55 more to go. Um, one, you have to develop a lifestyle that you're going to keep. And if you're like me and you like food, you're not going to keep doing that. And there's an evolutionary reason why I did for it gets worse because what happens in animals, or what happens in people that live traditionally, like the Maasai that I talked about, they have a wet season and a dry season, where right? times when there's lots of food and times when there's not a lot of food. So they have a skinny season and a fat season. So you fatten up when food is available. But if food's not available, when you starve, thyroid hormone goes down because you're trying to conserve those calories. You don't want to be burning fat and burning carbohydrates if there's no food coming in. So evolutionary, and this is true for all animals, if you diet or starve yourself, you're actually, that's why you have these yo-yo diets. You're actually pushing your body in a direction that the next time you eat, or when you go back to regular eating, you're gonna gain even more weight. Because now your thyroid hormone level's been going, oh, it's the dry season. Don't burn anything, and then you eat again. It's trying to make your body save up in, in anticipation of the next period where you're not gonna eat. Yeah. Some people say that fasting is good for your body. Uh, in what regard? In terms of in terms of maintaining your metabolism. Well, first off, like fasting for a day or something like that is probably not a big deal. I'm talking about there were times when I didn't eat 
So at this height where I am now, I'm like 195 now. I weigh 109 when I wrestle. Right? So that's like almost 90 pounds smaller than I am right now. So I'm talking about weeks of not eating, not like you know you skip the day or something like that. I don't know why it would be good for you. I would probably say no. I mean, the, the better thing for you also, so my the, the thing that was negative for me also, So the eating patterns are important because they're interacting with those hormones of what you can and can't store. So, yeah? So are you saying dieting doesn't work because it's like inher inherently doesn't work? I'm not saying dieting doesn't work. If you cut down your calories or if you monitor what you eat, you will lose weight. But if you drastically cut down your calories, you will also reduce your basal metabolic rate, which means you're more likely to gain weight. Right? If you go, if you go back, and you will go back, right? if, if you're, I mean, I've never tried diet. I mean, I can tell you, my metabolism is so crazy. I lose a pound a day, but if I go away for a weekend and go next exercise, I'll gain five pounds. Like I'll gain, a day. I don't think I eat five pounds worth of food, but I'll gain five pounds in one weekend just from that exercise. The other thing I used to, the other thing is that I used to say that I think was kind of insensitive. Is it seems like it's simple math that if you want to lose weight, you burn more calories than you take. And it is simple math, but some of it's also like psychology and, and, and other stuff. So you have to consider the self-image. Or for me, starting to exercise, I used to be able to look out of my window and run as far as I could see. And then you get depressed. So. Anyway, other questions and comments? And motivation for me, it actually, so my first time that I got in shape and stayed in shape, actually for almost 10 years, it was because I was turning 30, and that was such a big deal. Oh, God, I got to get in shape, it's turning 30. And this time, it was like somebody very dear to me rubbed my belly and said, I want you to be around and take my kids to Disneyland. And it was somebody who actually doesn't typically say nice things to me. <laughs> but the next day is when I started going to Think about that when you have friends that you're trying to talk about. Other questions or comments? If not, we're going to do Osmo Regulation on Tuesday, another personal story that I've learned from my daughter. I'm going to tell you why when my daughter was a baby, she never peed in the desert. That'll be the topic for next week. <laughs> See you on Tuesday.